Um, thank you, Fenella, and um, that was a, yeah, I don't know about legend, anyway. Um, but speaking of legends, thank you, Theesta, for your presentation. It was um, amazing, and Kenson, and, and all of those who have spoken today uh, and yesterday. Um, as a Northern Arundel and uh, Kalkadoon person, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of this country and uh, thank, um, even though I wasn't here, Aunty uh, May Maguire for the welcome to country. Uh, yesterday. I pay my respects to all of our elders, past and present. Yes, it's up there. Um, this important, uh, I'm sorry, my notes are a bit all over the place because as people say things, I keep writing things on them and, and adding to them, so, but I'll try and make sense of it. Um, and I don't have many slides because I've been out bush quite a lot, so I haven't had access to technology. But um, I wanted to talk about the importance of this protocol to start with, of acknowledging country, because it's a good way, I think, to think about the things that we're talking about in this session today and indeed in the, in the two days of this symposium. Um, and last night it occurred to me that I might use this quote um, for, uh, to just to put up while I'm saying some general comments because, again, it, it refers to country and, again, picking up with um, some of the things uh, Theesta was saying about what is the creative impulse. And as you can see, for Jungarai, there was a very clear creative impulse. Um, and it also, I, uh, the way that he's talking about, you know, country, I want to talk a bit more about country and how we understand it. Um, with particular regard to the, uh, the subject that we've been given in the, in the brochure there, that paragraph of, of um, information. So in considering uh, how artists and curators, et cetera, enliven the landscape, I think it's important to remember that for, for us as Indigenous people or Aboriginal people, the landscape is already enlivened. It is corporeal. It's sentient with, with the spirit of our ancestors who created this country. And this applies in cities as much as it does in rural or remote areas. But it is particularly um, in the context of urban environments that the protocol of welcome to country or acknowledgement of country, as I just gave, becomes highly pertinent in, re in reiterating our enduring connection and serving as a reminder that the urban landscape is still country. It's particularly important for members of Aboriginal communities um, as visitors to someone else's country to observe this protocol at events such as this, but it is also important for non-Indigenous people to recognise that we retain and maintain the connection to country that is our inheritance as the first people of this land, um, which endures into the, 21, into the 21st century. But this, uh, this is something that we as a nation cannot take for granted this inheritance of the world's oldest continuous cultural tradition. And, um, and often it appears indeed that um, uh, there's a lot of people out there who are stubbornly or even blindly ignorant of that fact. And I was, it uh, occurred to me, I won't go down this path, although I could, uh, when Kenson was talking about museums and the, the range of museums being, uh, that have been built and, and are underway in Singapore, that, of course, here in Australia, we don't have our own uh, national cultural museum space, centre or facility uh, to represent the arts, of our, arts and culture of our people. And I think it would have a, um, a series of buildings or places like this um, would have the effect. I, was, I was also thought it was wonderful, uh, the slide you showed, of the... Um, Paranakan Museum and the people, the local people whose museum it is, lining up, you know, in in uh, to attend that museum. And I think, yeah, I felt, I also felt that was a very moving um, moment. But I'm not going to go down that path um, because then I'll just get cranky. Um, <laughs> so, although you know, what's cranky? Um, so, I, uh, and then as a kind of a bit of a departure, I also just wanted to talk briefly about a project that I'm currently involved in, and as my disclaimer previously about having very few slides and uh, some sub garbled notes is that I've been involved in a project that is very close to my heart, um, and despite being a project that is in many ways the complete opposite of talking about work in the public realm or, you know, public artworks, it is, I think, pertinent to this conversation today as a it provides a good barometer for the cultural health of our nation, which I think in, in many ways we are at risk of standing by while it dies on the vine. 
So the background to this project is the alarming fact that it's estimated by 2050 that only 50 Aboriginal languages will be considered healthy. And one of those is Aranda, um, which is the language um, of my people. And that is from an, an original estimate of, estimate of 250 language groups at the time of colonisation. So although um, our community, the Yarrinder community, is seen as one of, you know, one of uh, many culturally strong communities in Australia, of the 5,000 or so Yarrinder people and roughly, let's say, half, two and a half thousand women, um, there are only 20 who have living memory and knowledge of the songs. Um, and they are all over 70 with chronic illnesses as plagues members of our community, as we know. Uh, for instance, at least one of these elderly ladies is the only holder of a song that is, uh, in, that is their song for a very important dreaming story that runs through the region. So in response to this, a group of um, Aranda women from the region in and around Ubuntuwa, or Alice Springs, uh, are currently engaged in a five week long camp on the outskirts of town that is restricted to women and uh, girls only and basically uh, people are living there, different family groups come in, different song holders are coming in and having this sort of turn being resident in the camp and that night the songs are sung and danced and this is all being recorded for an archive and a bit like uh, the was saying, we don't know where the archive is gonna go or who will hold it or you know, what sort of access will be around it but we just feel that it is critically urgent that these songs are recorded and you know, preserved for poster uh, posterity. Um, one of the great things that's happening is that um, there's a lot of young uh, women, including my daughters actually, who are um, staying there at the camp and basically aside from being general, everyone's general slave um, they are also getting cups of teas and um, being you know shouted orders to go down to the shops and get things day, day to day they are also being having the opportunity to see these dancers and even sometimes participate in them and, and to learn these songs so it's a wonderful it's a wonderful experience um, and the reason why songs are of course important is that they are the vehicle, a very key vehicle in an oral tradition for sharing and handing on knowledge, both sacred and secular, and keeping, you know, keeping language alive, keeping knowledge alive, and keeping these stories alive. And the key point, uh, one of the key points about this is that it's, it's through this process of reiteration that this knowledge becomes embedded. So, I'm just, I'm grabbing, sorry, I'm just getting touched. Um, And this is sort of a segue into uh, another um, point about the forum and refers to this quote by jong up here, is that I just wanted to note that, you know, I've, I feel this forum is very timely um, with the threatened closure of uh, remote area indigenous communities in this state. And, you know... It, anyone with even the most basic understanding of Aboriginal society, and here's a good testament to that, even Pauline Hanson, um, <laughs> which I'll explain who she is later, um, understands the injustice of such a proposition. That has, of course, led to thousands of people taking to the streets in capital cities around our nation. Um, and you might have seen people holding up, people like, um, is that actor, uh, Hugh... Hugh Jackman holding up signs, you know, saying stop the, the, stop the closure of this community. So it's really kind of galvanised people, I think. Um, but, you know, one of the things is, you know, yes, you can see that there's a, you know, the, the issue of, of human rights, but also, you know, you don't have to be kind of a rocket scientist to foresee the cataclysmic potential of such a proposition and the far-reaching consequences of effectively making 150 communities homeless, which will irrevocably alter the social and cultural fabric of this state. And I say homeless because... Before... <laughs> Um, I say homeless because for the Pintabi people, for example, of uh, who uh, uh, Jungara was, a, was a, a Pintabi man, who live in one of the identified communities, Kirikura, which is the um, one of the hubs of Papanya Tula artists, who are of course uh, quite well regarded on the world stage, and indeed um, in the background of one of your collector's photos, Ken, uh, Kenson, there was an artwork. Uh, one of the collectors had a work by one of these artists. Um, these are one of the identified, you know, dead lost communities. Um, Kirikura, and in that community, Nura 
is the word for country and it's also the word for home. So when we're talking about the removal of these communities, we're talking about making people homeless. So with these thoughts about country and in thinking about how art can, and I quote, transform our environments and how we use them, we are, and uh, hopefully obviously, and as recent, uh, the recent presentations have shown, we're thinking about art that is beyond the sort of art for art's sake. And it's beyond transforming a space by, say, switching on a few colourful lights. Um, the objective for this art is to transform not how we use the environment, I think, but how we understand it. Uh, I was recently working on a project at Tarawara and the director of the museum there said, uh, described it as not just about admiring the view, it's about understanding the view. Or to quote... Lucy Lippard, for instance, when she, she says that we understand, you know, about understanding landscape, not just as space, but as place. And she says, space defines landscape, where space combined with memory defines place. So cities are not the only places where memory has often been eroded or fragmented, usually through the purposeful act of attempted erasure or cultural genocide. Um, but it is often where it is most evident. But however, it is also in these environments, and I think it's really important to remember that, where new cultures grow and flourish. So while we celebrate the new or the contemporary, it should not have to be while mourning what was before, um, despite the significant impact of colonisation on communities in what are today's metro metropolises. So as we move towards a more environmentally and spiritually sustainable way of life, the, mem the living memory of country in the broader sense of the term, needs to be part of the journey to remind us all that our country is more than a space for commercial exploitation. It is a place for us and for future generations to call home. Art or cultural activity in an urban landscape is a mechanism by which this living memory can be maintained or amplified to embrace contemporary experience, often in stark to relief what, often in stark to relief what otherwise appears an utterly colonised space. Art transforms space into place. But while being an agent and driver of change, it can't and doesn't perform this task single-handedly necessarily. A recent statement, and again, this is from another, not a quote by Pauline Hanson, but I'm mentioning another conservative, which is a bit of a shock, um, could well be applied to urban environments in the present day. Um, and indeed, I think it points to the inextricability of, of cultural and political agency, whether it be um, acknowledgement of country, constitutional change, or public art, in striving for recognition. So this, uh, uh, this proposition, this quote comes from uh, Julian Lesser, who's a former executive director of the Menzies Research Centre, whatever that is, um, who is proposing as an alternative to constitutional change, a declaration of recognition. Um, and he says, you know, it's a heavily contested space. And the best thing that the Declaration of Recognition does in this space is that it really culturally, in people's hearts and minds, through repetition at those great national events, places Indigenous people at the front of our thoughts and places them at the centre of our policy making. Um, and this is what I, I hope and think that cultural projects should do. It's through this, through this repetition um, achieve this recognition that puts us on the agenda. Um, and I was just thinking uh, again about the, I've been involved in the Sydney Modern Project, and um, which is the proposal for the Art Gallery of New South Wales to greatly expand their premises in Sydney. And one of the things that, uh, in thinking this through, I was thinking of the place where, you know, Aboriginal art, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art would be shown in this gallery in the different proposals. And I, I kept thinking it's, you know, it's got to be at the front, it's got to be at the top of the building, it's got to be, you know, the first thing you see as you walk through the door. And then thinking through, well, why, why that? Why if you've got a, a kind of a better space curatorially that might be a few doors, few floors down or, but you know, but it serves the art better and the display better. And I thought, well, the reason why is because we need that recognition. That's what we have to have at front and center in everyone's minds. So um, forms of, uh, social activation or activism, such as Welcome to Country, uh, I mentioned the Recognised Campaign and indeed the demonstrations against the closure of the Western Australian communities, while arguably not conventionally art per se, are still a key means of activating the public realm in tandem with what we might think of as more traditional works of art or artistic programs. 
and they serve to make us understand the view, and particularly in city environments, which are, of course, the known habitats of the opinion or change makers of this country. Um, so with those sort of preceding remarks, I just wanted to now use the dreaded clicker to show you a picture of Sydney. Um, I, I just wanted to discuss a couple of projects that I have been involved in in Sydney. Um, Corroboree Sydney, uh, as Fenella mentioned, which is a, an annual festival, and Eora Journey, which is a um, <coughs> Sydney of uh, City project. Um, and the intention of both of these, the kind of fundamental intention of both of these is to transform the urban landscape of, of Sydney City, and we're talking about the CBD, the bit with all the big buildings and then just some of the surrounding suburbs. Um, uh, yeah, so to recognise the traditional custodianship of the Gadigal people, uh, one of the Eora nations that comprise the greater Sydney region, but also the contemporary community that calls Sydney um, home today. Needless to say, the heart of Sydney uh, City is a contested site. In one of the most beautiful harbours in the world is the cove where the first fleeters landed. And uh, thinking about this last night, I, it, I was reminded um, of uh, Malcolm X's great quote about Plymouth Rock, um, not landing on Plymouth Rock, having the rock land on his people. And um, I think that's a very similar experience to ours. Um, but the city, of course, is now prime Australian real estate and it's home to the world-renowned architectural icons. With the suburb of Redfern, where this, uh, this image is taken um, at the city edge, uh, it has continued to be a prominent stage for contesting claims between Aboriginal people and the newcomers, right from the guerrilla campaign led by Pemulwuy in the late 18th century and throughout the social politics of the 20th century, which has resulted in some significant firsts in uh, housing, legal aid, childcare and health services. And despite this, our people have remained, or perhaps, uh, you know, because of this, our people have remained largely socially and culturally disenfranchised in this city. And I think that that is what I'm talking about. It's because of this lack of visibility, this lack of recognition that Jen drives policy in a, in a, in a, a favourable direction. So Corroboree Sydney um, began with the collective desire of a group of colleagues working in the cultural industry to collaborate and uh, showcase the rich heritage and dynamic cultural expression that is part of Sydney today, and by extension, New South Wales, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities within the national context. Um, we felt that we, we, we lacked the opportunity to present a more holistic perspective in terms of the uh, multi-art form practice of um, Indigenous artists was lacking in Australia's, you know, gateway city, um, and especially given that Sydney is now home to the largest population of Aboriginal people in Australia. Um, we also felt that there was this real um, uh, perception of people, perhaps visitors, especially visitors coming to Australia, but also many Australians, that, you know, Aboriginal art is kind of dot painting or bark painting from further north and what, so Corroboree was very, you know, is very much about, uh, it has the culture of Sydney and New South Wales communities at its heart. And uh, one of the things I think when people look at, you know, Sydney and think, you know, they don't see much evidence of Indigenous culture, you know, that's what Corroboree's about. It's about drawing that up, if you like, from the ground up. And, and one of the best examples of that is, for instance, that Corroboree is a Sydney word. Um, it was first heard by Europeans at a ceremonial site, which is, um, what, is, is what is now in the, uh, what was in the, uh, at a place that is now the Royal Botanic Garden. So, so the idea took shape as an annual festival, um, including the participations of the organisations that the um, Aboriginal uh, staff represented. One of the important things we um, decided was that the, a criterion was established that the partner institutions um, were eligible to, you know, play, if you like, or, or be in the festival. They had to um, either be Indigenous organisations or have a demonstrated commitment to Indigenous arts, which, was ev which is evidenced by their employment um, and their programming record. So big institutions that don't employ um, blackfellas or don't have regular programs that showcase our arts are not part of Corroboree Sydney. So we're trying to use that as a, a bit of a lever to get people to, um, you know, do better. 
Um, so the initial membership of nine partners uh, was founded for uh, the festival's first year in 2013, and that included the Art Gallery of New South Wales, the Australian Museum, Bangara Dance Theatre Australia, Blackfella Films, Koori Radio 93.7 FM, you have to say the whole title, Museum of Contemporary Art Australia, also have to say the whole title, Royal Botanic Garden Sydney, State Library of New South Wales and the Sydney Opera House. In 2014, the Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority and the Australian National Maritime Museum joined the group and we have strong interest from many um, organisations to, to be part of the formal alliance of Corroboree Sydney uh, institutions. Um, one of the key principles that was established from the outset of the festival included um, that the program of presenting the festival was, was truly collaborative and participatory um, between the partner organisations. And one of the key things that we wanted to do, as I said before, was to uh, really acknowledge Sydney culture, you know, Sydney people and Sydney culture, and to to recognise the contribution that our people have made in in this you know major city in Australia. But we also wanted to make sure that the local community um, were really engaged. So not just only as the presenters of the work, but also as the audience for the work. And again, going back to the museum in Singapore, that's why it's great to see all that local mob lining up to get into to that museum and, and you know, to to feel that, you know, it's really important. I think it's something that many of our institutions struggle to do is to reach out and get the local community to be the audience for the work that they're presenting. Um, we kept it in a fairly tight footprint. Obviously, it was around, you know, it's a very significant site for all Australians, and we wanted to sort of give a, uh, the view, the sort of before and after view of that particular site. Um, we uh, actually engaged in order to guide us uh, to ensure cultural protocols would be maintained to the highest standard. We also invited a council of elders to be the patrons and the sort of, you know, uh, guides um, and supporters of the festival. And so a list of, um, of locally respected elders who either were uh, practicing art or who are practicing artists or who have a particular experience in working with the elder community were invited to, um, to be members of that council. And um, we also chose those elders based on, because around the, around the uh, sort of CBD, there's a number of suburbs, Woolloomooloo, Glebe, Redfern, Waterloo, where there are, and then further out, La Perouse, where there are sort of significant local, if you like, suburban, city suburban um, indigenous communities. And our five elders are uh, Ms Millie Ingram, Mr Roy Kennedy, Mr Charles Madden, Ms Elaine Russell, and Ms es Esme Timbury. Um, so one of the key objectives also of Corroboree Sydney was to, to create a distinctive presence within the range of festivals and major events that are offered in Sydney and around the nation. Around the nation. Um, and the curated sort of collaboration of the partners is, is central to realising this. But we also developed a number of uh, sort of signature events that would sort of try and give the festival a bit of an umbrella, you know, festival feel and also to sort of offer participation on a large, public participation on a large scale. And one of the things that we've, um, one of the things, I guess, one of the challenges that we've had as a festival is in order to facilitate that opportunity for our people to be the audience for the work and to participate um, many of the events and to in, to encourage the wide participation of you know the wider community is that many of the events have to be free you know we so there's this real one of the challenges that we're facing now as we think about the last couple of years and where we might go in the future is is how we can create a sort of financially sustainable model. We think we've got a very good culturally sustainable model, but um, there is a tension certainly between uh, what funding agencies require, what their idea of a successful festival is, and what ours might be. And one of the terms that I've learnt in the last few years is this thing called bed nights, um, which I didn't realise was such a vital um, aspect of our economy, um, which means basically that, you know, hotels are getting people staying there, I think. Um, but of course, for us, it's not really about that. It's a bit more about, you know, it's the cultural, bala cultural ballast that um, uh, Kenson was talking about, how we are investing, you know, in the future of this city and, and literally changing the shape, transforming this city culturally. Um, so one of the, uh, just, a, just a couple of, sorry, I don't have slides for everything, but um, one of the, this firelight, this is the firelight, which is a, sort of a symbol, I guess an important element of Corroboree Sydney. It symbolises the 
ceremonial fire of a traditional corroboree. Uh, it's designed by a contemporary artist from New South Wales, Jonathan Jones. Um, and he's designed it so that it embraces, you know, in a contemporary way, the elements of water um, and earth. And as you can see, uh, it's like a big Corten cauldron, basically, with the top surface of it is, 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 a, is a sheet of water and that, of course, reflects the sky. So what we're trying to do is to sort of capture or express that connection to country in the broader sense of country, the earth, the water and the sky um, that is still, you know, very, uh, very, you know, it is the bedrock of our people's existence and in Sydney as, as much as anywhere else. Um, and this is usually, this firelight is lit at the beginning of the ceremony um, and that uh, Bangara dances, Stephen Page choreographs this wonderful ceremonial performance where the elders light this cauldron um, to uh, begin, the, begin, the, begin the festival. And as someone said to me, oh, it's just like the Olympics. And I was like, well, we've been doing this for a lot longer than the Olympics. <laughs> the Olympics are like us, okay? Thank you. Um, <laughs> so... Just thought I'd just make a point about that. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, I'm just zipping through. Um, I do actually have a slide of someone doing something. Um, this is the, one of the things that we've developed is the Gurung Parade, and it's a really key sort of symbolic event for Corroboree, as it, 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 it's all about, um, really it's about children being the torchbearers, you know, uh, the future generations who will be proud to be part of this history um, and, and part of, you know, to become part of the Aboriginal story that is a uniquely Australian story. Um, Gurung means child um, in the Sydney language and one of the things that uh, we do is we invite schools to participate and we've had schools from as far away as Burke, um, which is a far away for those of you who aren't from New South Wales, um, to to you know participate with. I think the first year we had about uh, fifteen hundred children, and last year well over two thousand. And there's very strong interest. And what they do is the schools that uh, register their interest. Um, did you put that up? Oh, five minutes ago. Oh, shit. Um, the schools that register and just get an education kit and they get to make this Waratah, which is a Waratah, which is a very significant um, uh, cultural symbol for the Aboriginal community, which coincident, I didn't realise it actually is also the state emblem, but um, again, we were there first. Um, and it represents, um, you know, it, it, this is a story, the Waratah story is a story of undying love, these, these two Wanga pigeons, how the white Waratah becomes red. And so what happens is the children learn this story in the school, they get a video of um, one of our um, South Coast elders, uh, Ms Julie Freeman, tells that story, they hear a welcome to country, they get the um, resources to make these Waratahs and then they parade them from Hyde Park down Macquarie Street, uh, not incidentally right past Parliament House, and then they go into the Botanic Gardens where they have a wonderful picnic and, and a performance by some of the, um, you know, the higher school students that are working in the arts, the Indigenous students. So it's a fantastic, um, it's a really, really wonderful and fantastic um, moment when you see all of these thousands of school children. And you would think that you know, arming children with sticks would just result in a million sword fights, but they all carry them so respectfully and so proudly. Um, it's just great to see all these kids of all these backgrounds who are all learning about Sydney and learning about the true significance of the city that they call home. I'm going to tear through these now because I've got probably no more minutes left. Um, we've the other thing that we've done uh, is the black arts markets where we have invited and subsidised the participation of artists from right across New South Wales to have a to come in and have a weekend market in Sydney, which has been fantastic because for me, even working in the arts for so many years, I had no idea of the wealth of talent that was out there in regional um, New South Wales. But I am going to just leave that and race through. Um, oh, not that. I don't have time for that either. Um, so uh, in 2007 and 2008, uh, the city of Sydney um, embarked on this really major consultation program called uh, 2030 Global Green, Global and Connected, um, which I think tells you what it's about. Um, but one of, the, one of the outcomes of that consultation was that 84% of city residents uh, believe a diverse mix of people and cultures in the city is important um, and they highly valued and respected Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and 87% of people, you know, had that view. So one of the things that followed after that was that Clover Moore, the Lord Mayor Clover Moore, after having, um, having I think, 
to be fair, to be convinced, as well as having to convince others, um, released, the, uh, released an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander statement where she used the I word, she used invaded, um, when she said, uh, you know, British outpost was established. This had far-reaching and devastating impacts on the Eora Nation, including the occupation and appropriation of their traditional lands. Despite the destructive impact of this invasion, Aboriginal culture endured. And so, I'll just skip over that a bit. Um, so it was very, that was a really, I think, you know, it was, it was fairly well reported and there was a, you know, a lot of angst happening inside council about that word being adopted. Um, but it was something that was conditional, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Panel of the city of Sydney absolutely refused to compromise in any way. That's the word that needs to be used. That's what happened. And so it was fantastic that the city of Sydney um, endorsed that. And that basically sort of paved the way for the Eora journey um, to, the, to be implemented, which includes a number of different elements. Um, and one of them is recognition in the public domain. And that's the pro some of the projects that I've been working on. Um, uh, so, this is um, uh, this is a, a, a little uh, terrace, red fern, as I just showing you. That's the the same image, the um, the flag down there at a site called the Block in Redfern, which is I think quite famous. Um, it's an Aboriginal community, and it's been the site of actually amazing initiatives, amazing firsts in achieving fantastic social outcomes. But it is more widely known, I think, around Australia as a some sort of kind of place that's, you know, on permanent riot watch. But um, I live just down the road and it's, you know, it's not the case. But so one of the things that's undergoing um, a great deal of uh, development, the Pemawai project is rolling out there now where they're looking at um, affordable um, housing for Indigenous people as well as some commercial activity to support that. Um, it is, that's a very contested site as well. Um, but uh, what we wanted to do was in, in the process of uh, what's been happening, there's been this one little corner terrace which um, has remained standing, even if abandoned, right on the corner of uh, just just very very close to the, to the actual block itself. I mean, in looking at that, we were kind of inspired to think um, by examples such as the Tenement Museum in in New York about how this little fragment of social history, if you like, in that area could be used to become a site of memory, to become a place um, for people to, um, to you know, remember uh, Redfern and to share those stories with their children. It's certainly something that all of the aunties and uncles that you talk to around the place are very interested in doing. So as a start, Rico Rennie, a Gamilaroi artist um, who lives in Melbourne, um, but he's a New South Wales fella, um, was asked to create um, kind of a, just to sort of bring people's eyes to the building, to get people to start thinking. And as I, like, uh, again, Theasta was saying, it's just to sort of, to just don't know what's gonna happen with it, but it's just like, okay, everyone, it's there. And your kids, there's one of them there. You know, we got um, some of the local uh, young people who were sort of um, engaged in the Tribal Warrior Program to do workshops with Rico, and they learn all these skills in, you know, stenciling and spray painting and, and what they wanted to do. They effectively designed the build, designed the facade of the building and then painted it themselves. Um, and so that was great because, of course, one of the ways to engage community is that if you get the kids involved, then you get the aunties, the mums and dads, aunties, uncles, but particularly the grandparents all coming along and, you know, having, uh, having a watch and obviously, which is very welcome, giving you their two cents worth. Um, and these are some of the... Um, young people that were involved and, and did some of these, you know, paintings and so on in the lead up to um, creating that work. So that's a, that's a work in progress. Don't really know where that'll go or what it'll be, but it's something that I think, again, will be driven primarily from the community um, and be this, yeah, this place for stories and for just for sharing. And like the older circles, really, that we, we do at Corroboree Sydney, it's just about a place for people just to sit down together and have a yarn, you know, talk about the grandkids, talk about the weather, talk about whatever they want, but it's just a place for people to connect, hopefully. Um, another, am I done? I'm done, okay. Um, I'm gonna jump, even though this work is absolutely fabulous, I'm just gonna quickly jump to one we launched last week. You imagine me, that it's let fall, which is Tony Albert's um, tribute to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander service men and service women who have uh, defended our country. This work is located in Hyde Park in Sydney. Um, it, 
it's, um, as you can see, these bullets are almost eight metres high, made of uh, metal and steel, uh, metal and marble. Um, and on this boomerang sort of relief uh, stage, there's a, a like a Coolamon type receptacle there that is for you know smoking ceremonies and so on. Um, the city commissioned this work in response to a very in response to the community calling for something to you know honour. Uh, indigenous diggers, and so this was a very much a community-driven project, um, which had this, which eventually had the support of the RSL, uh, the Veterans uh, Veterans Association, um, and 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 government, uh, New South Wales Governor David Hurley, who spoke at the launch, said, uh, who's the former Defence Force chief, said that the work restores Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heroes to their rightful place in the canon of Australian war history from which they have vanished. So I think that's great, that idea of recognition. Um, the four bullets are, are a story of uh, uh, Tony's grandfather. He used his sort of personal story to talk more broadly about um, Indigenous community. They were uh, uh, captured in Italy um, and for before... Uh, uh, they escaped, prisoners of war, sorry, who escaped, and then when they were captured at a farmhouse near Italy, um, they were lined up and, and three of them were executed before um, the commanding officer said, you know, stop, they're, they're British allies, we have to send them to Germany. And so this is the story of um, remembering those who survived, but also those who fell. Um, it's also, thou didst let fall, as a, a Gadigal word, is about the idea of soldiers, you know, serving their country and then coming back to find that the, you know, the camaraderie and the mateship they experienced as, as members of the armed forces, you know, this, nothing had changed when they got home, couldn't get into the RSL, weren't entitled to soldier settlements um, and so on, which I don't, I'm not undermining its significance, I'm just conscious of time. Um, so, uh, there's a full, uh, th 31st of March we launched that in Sydney right in Hyde Park, and it's right near the Anzac Memorial, Bangara, um, performed uh, to, to, on, on this occasion as well. Um, and I just wanted to put this in because it, it, in terms of recognition and achieving recognition, um, and this of course, as you can see, is a, an image from back in the day where, where you know, these diggers are, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, claim what is rightfully is theirs, the recognition um, for their contribution. And so, I just thought it might be good to finish with this slide, which, which is um, here's Tony, um, you know, uh, talking about his work, and and it's ostensibly about honouring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander servicemen and service women who have, you know, as I said, defended and protected our country as our people always have, but it's also about gaining recognition on the national stage, and it's a message, you know, as the Arundel Women's Camp has taught me, that has to be continually reiterated, you know, lest we forget. So thank you very much.